Uh, so I appreciate you guys coming because there's like four other sessions going on with panels and stuff like that. So it's nice of you guys to, to make it out to this open banking one. Um, so in this presentation, I'm going to give a brief uh, description of my organization and myself. I'm going to introduce the concept of open banking and how it's progressing around the world. I'll talk about the different roles that financial institutions are taking in light of this um, new open banking business model. I'm also going to touch on why open banking is probably not going to shake up uh, the bank's predominant position, as some may think. Uh, this is, it's not really revolutionary, it's more evolutionary. Uh, and that's going to lead me into discussing about open source and open standards. Uh, I'm going to describe sort of at the fundamental level why open banking policy is aligned with the open source way. Uh, and then I'm going to give a couple examples of what governments are doing in the world around this and talk about the difference between open source and open standards and then open standards and quasi and proprietary uh, standards, uh, quasi quasi open standards and why these quasi open and proprietary standards aren't really aligned with the goals of open banking. And then I'm going to finish with a bit of a strategic sort of uh, recommendations, I guess you could say, uh, for, for why banks should be sort of pushing for open standards. Uh, feel free to interrupt me at any point. There's not that many people here. I can hear you if you just raise your hand or just speak over me. Uh, happy to have a conversation. Uh, so yeah, I'll just a little bit about me. Um, I'm from uh, Ottawa, Canada. I work for an organization called the Large Credit Union Coalition. I am a member of the Digital Identity and Authentication Council of Canada, which is uh, promoting digital ID adoption in Canada. Uh, we just had a really cool thing happen where um, uh, a company called Interact, which is the Canadian sort of payments facilitator, uh, acquired a company uh, license called uh, Secure Key, which is providing digital ID. So we're kind of getting a bank ID sort of like in Switch, uh, sorry, Sweden uh, in Canada, which is uh, quite exciting. Um, I'm also a member of the Open Banking Initiative Canada, which is uh, promoting um, open banking. Uh, and I'm working on my CDMP, uh, which is Certified Data Management Professional. So um, yeah, the purpose of this slide is just to give a quick overview of the Large Credit Union Coalition. These are all of our brands. There's 12 credit unions. Um, uh, my position here is, uh, when I'm speaking here, is not necessarily reflective of, of these organizations. Uh, the Canadian credit union system, it has 5.9 million members in the English-speaking one. Uh, there's a separate system in Quebec. Uh, it's a company called, uh, or a cooperative called Desjardins. Um, the Canadian, or sorry, the English side has 273 billion assets under management. We have uh, 1,700 branches, 58,000 employees in aggregate, and uh, we're the only financial institution in 394 Canadian communities, which we see as a source of pride because we're providing um, services that they normally wouldn't get. If you look at the uh, graph here, um, the largest, uh, the largest hundred have about 90% of uh, system assets, but we have about 235 uh, credit unions. So the it's like a really long skew as far as assets go. When you're looking at the largest 10, which is the group that I essentially represent, we have about half of the system assets. So that would be, I guess, closer to like 150 billion for the organizations I represent. Um, on the, what I do with the uh, credit unions is this, uh, these green highlighted ones. Uh, so we provide advice or um, engage in this, uh, the Canadian ecosystem around API, gateways, consent management, digital ID, cybersecurity, uh, and then governance on an actual sort of open banking market. Uh, and, and then we talk about all these things with regulators. Uh, so a registry, accreditation, digital ID, API standards, uh, the, what the utility or platform is going to look like, and, and data governance, and all those important things that are required for um, uh, open banking. So the uh, one to the point for context as well, because um, you might be like, this guy's a total noob for this stuff, and you might already be like farther ahead on me on this, but we're, um, we have similar challenges as the established banks, uh, which is that um, we're seeing this rapid digitization of uh, services and, and internal systems, and we uh, have never really had to do that as part of our value chain. We've always been able to do this stuff internally, 
Um, and whereas you have these fintechs that are building things just for specific connections to that value chain and have done everything sort of um, uh, in a uh, focused, targeted, and modern framework way, we don't have that. And so we haven't built our internal applications to work with external networks. And so we're having a lot of challenges in, in working through that. So what is open banking? Uh, it's a system that allows consumers to share their financial data between financial institutions and accredited third party uh, service providers. So fintechs or um, agencies, governments, NGOs, et cetera. Uh, it's supposed to give consumers greater choice and control over their data. And it's supposed to be done in a secure way. So essentially to um, remove the um, option, in, at least in Canada, one of the main impetuses was to remove the option of screen scraping, which is essentially to grab the data from the site using a bot. And that data isn't necessarily accurate, isn't necessarily secure, because you're providing your username and password to a third party. And that might be aggregating it and um, causing a bunch of issues. Um, so the model here is that this is the current model where this guy has to take all of his financial data from all these different financial institutions, and then he has to aggregate it himself. And the open banking model, where you have a credit union or a bank, and they do all the aggregation for you, and that person doesn't have to do all the work, and so they're a lot happier. So uh, in oh, the world of open banking, so government-regulated open banking is, is uh, I would argue, uh, de facto and open source uh, open banking in that uh, the argument would be that the government regulation is controlled by the people and it's therefore automatically in the commons and open source is uh, essentially a public good. Um, Market-led open banking, on the other hand, in often becomes proprietary. The strategy of the market is to try and get ahead of that regulation and so often uh, markets will start introduce or market-led initiatives will start introducing things like market codes of conduct or uh, sort of principles-based um, solutions, and those become sort of pragmatically useless because they uh, they create barriers that essentially try to protect or provide a defensive stance for the existing status quo that don't eventually um, don't really get adopted or uh, it just becomes uh, reinforcement of the status quo. So when you see um, places like the European Union and the UK um, uh, introducing government regulated standards, they're the ones who really sort of kicked off open banking as a uh, really um, uh, for the rest of the world to take it on. Uh, if, if it wasn't for the governments of the European Union and the UK to actually say we're going to sort of mandate um, standards, uh, the rest of the world wouldn't have, uh, they would be moving a lot slower essentially. So I, I think even, sorry, I'm just gonna, one last point here. I think you even see this um, with the market-led ones, uh, as I was saying about how uh, the market-led ones are uh, become sort of not super useful. The Berlin Group just launched, I guess last year, and some of you might know more than me about this, but they just launched um, uh, Open Finance uh, Group which is essentially taking their next-gen PSD2 framework, but then adding more variables to it. And they're actually doing it now in sort of an open standards development way as being a bit more transparent, which I think is pretty neat because the previous way was it was just the banks discussing and now they're trying to open it up for like more uh, discussion. Uh, so regarding business models, uh, this is from the European Banking Association. It's around since like 2016, essentially a model of how financial institutions can take different roles. Um, the, you can say that you know all traditional banks have this integ integrator role where they offer the products and services, they offer the connections, and then they do the distribution to the member or the customer. Um, and then there's different sort of models now where you could be a producer and then allow someone else to do your distribution of your products and services on a platform, for example. You could be the platform provider that then takes the products that are sort of distributed. Or you could do the distributor role where a bank may say, we don't even want to develop these products and services, we're just going to distribute it to our members and charge some sort of fee uh, around that. Um, this is, uh, sorry, I'm just reading my notes here and I, wrote them. Oh yeah, the, the, we're seeing the sort of this evolution of traditional finance into playing one of these roles in the open banking ecosystem. The focus is going to be 
is a little bit of debate around this, but the focus is that it would no longer be about sort of building a product, but it would actually be about um, creating experiences uh, and, and, you know, it kind of goes into sort of um, IT or startup logic, but focusing on the experience rather than product production and that difference of approach leads to sort of less vertical stack integration, such as in this um, uh, integrator role, and, and more about leveraging what the market's already developed uh, and, and to be, be essentially becoming a curator uh, of like the best products for, for your clients or your members. Um, so that changes the mindset from that internal focus uh, with the client in mind uh, and to, to having one with the client in mind, which should lead to sort of a less rigid experience at your traditional bank and, and to a more user-friendly one. Um, and so the realities of open banking market forces, this sort of ecosystem model, is leading to um, established FIs being afraid of this and, and wanting to maintain sort of market dominance. And so they're starting to sort of drag their feet and they're saying, we're not gonna, it's gonna take us a decade. I think there was a survey that just came out last week uh, for UK saying that it's gonna take a decade for open banking to be implemented in, in uh, the UK, which I think is not necessarily true. Um, but what it's done, all that feet dragging has created this cottage industry of all these fintechs and uh, other companies that are becoming sort of um, aggregators or platform providers to help build those connections. Uh, and uh, essentially that's a huge pain in the butt um, to do because you have to work with a bunch of different ones. The APIs that are being published are not necessarily uh, standardized. It, it just creates just a ton of work. So um, I would say that that's sort of the banking industry in aggregate, not all of them. Like there's BBVA and Santander that are very, and HSBC that are very sort of pro open banking and they see the benefits, but there are others that are, I'd say most are saying, you know, we're gonna drag our feet. There's just too much to do. It's, it's a, we have legacy uh, products and services and, and core banking systems that's just gonna take too long. And I would argue that they shouldn't worry about that and so I'm gonna get into some academic theory here. Um, so there's these two concepts. Uh, there's a paper that came out uh, in last year by Lam and Liu, and I believe the title was, actually I have it on my phone. Let me just grab it here so I don't forget. Uh, it was, does data portability facilitate entry? And it was in the International Journal of Industrial Organization. And essentially, there's a small but growing academic literature that explores the implications of the adoption of data portability pol policies, which is sort of a, similar to uh, open banking and what's in GDPR and, and PDSD2, et cetera. So uh, Lam and Liu, uh, they developed an economic model to explore the implications of these two effects that they say arise from data portability um, as currently is formulated in, in the EU for or PSD2. Uh, and these two are switching facilitation and demand expansion. So switching facilitation, as the graphic I put up here uh, shows, it, or tries to show anyways, is that if the rules make it easy for consumers to move their information, then this should reduce the lock-in effect that currently characterizes many consumer business relationships. So if someone gets really frustrated with their data being held and they're losing money or whatever, time, et cetera, they're gonna then use the open banking regulations uh, with the standardized data sharing that's mandated by the government to then share it with um, uh, or port their data over to a com more competitive bank or financial institution and they'll be happy. Um, so that's sort of the main thing that the banks are I think afraid of. They're like, if we open up our data then people are just gonna move to something more competitive. And that's a threat that you know, we still think about even at the credit unions is that you have venture capital coming in from um, uh, and sponsoring fintechs that are then offering uh, things for free. So in Canada, we just had uh, um, a big you know, multi-million dollar uh, fintech or venture capital firm funding a company called Wellsimple to offer free trading for all of our uh, for like commission-free trading for um, ETFs and stocks and stuff like that. And all the traditional banks are still charging you like eight bucks or something like that. So people are switching and they're afraid that 
venture capital can just th keep on throwing so much money at it that people will switch. So they're like, no, we don't want to share our data. But there's this other factor, which going back to the model I was showing you guys, is that um, it's called the demand expansion effect. And so the demand expansion effect uh, essentially says that if the data is actually easier to port, it also makes it easier for customers to share their information with their current service providers. And if the incumbents invest heavily in providing you know, um, value-added data an analysis and aggregation services, or just from pure network effects of there's so many different things out there and you have a really convenient um, consent management tool or something with your bank, um, they're not gonna move. Uh, it's gonna deepen the existing relationship with their clients. So in cir certain circumstances, uh, this demand expansion effect could outweigh the switching facilitation effect, uh, and that would entrench the incumbent's relationship uh, and, for, and forestall a new entry or stop um, uh, challenger banks from coming in and trying to sort of take over with competitive uh, offers. Uh, sorry, I'm just moving my notes here. There's also the, the factor that um, open banking regulation and uh, in the financial sector regulation is uh, very strong and, and these technical standards to sort of program that regulation could create high implementation costs for, for new firms. So essentially the argument is that given that open banking is becoming regulated everywhere as I was showing in the previous slides with the world map and that the demand expansion effect would have a, uh, would have a stronger effect than switching facilitation on existing clients, um, provided that the banks are not sticking their head in the sands and developing all the analytics tools and enhanced data um, capabilities, banks should actually be augmenting their data analysis functionality and welcoming open banking adoption. And they should be encouraging the use of open standards to make it easier for new entrants to share their data uh, because they would want to build that demand expansion effect. But, Oh, actually, I'm going to do a little bit of open banking stuff, which I might run through pretty quick. Like everyone here is relatively familiar with open banking, uh, or sorry, open source and open, I assume, because you guys are all at the conference. Uh, so the argument I was making here is that um, open banking should follow open source's principles of common good uh, to achieve its policy objectives, uh, as well as the bank's objectives. And I'm using this picture here I found off the internet from an early session of parliament which ironically I was reading up on, and apparently Parliament was closed to public access until the late 1800s, like you actually couldn't figure out what was going on. But I think the principle still remains that it was a group of people coming together to discuss uh, issues publicly and collaborating. Um, these are open banking policy goals, uh, and these are open the open source way, uh, the GitHub site, the open source way that sort of lists out the principles, I think Red Hat developed that. Um, but so things like transparency, collaboration, uh, release early, release often, uh, which could be a sort of pr uh, proxy to pragmatism, uh, and then inclusive meritocracy and community align with a lot of what you see in different open banking policy uh, goals that are released by different governments. So like Canadian government, for example, these are the ones from the Canadian government, but they're very similar to what the UK and Australia put out. And that's around transparency, open standards, industry collaboration, uh, fair representation and community and uh, interoperability. Um, what you're seeing in different uh, regions as well, at least, uh, and this was sort of mentioned at an earlier presentation today about regulatory um, regimes uh, and uh, regulators becoming, changing sort of their policy process and their regulatory practices. This is, um, the Australia's uh, consumer data standards, the consumer data right um, is the name of their open banking legislation. This is actually all on GitHub. You can go to the site and you can click on standards and you can see um, all the different uh, issues that they've raised. So they essentially propose a standard and they have industry, consumer advocacy groups, government, actually commenting on the issue to develop it. This is actually be done transparently and in the open, which I think is amazing. I've never seen this before, um, but this is like an open source way of doing um, policy development and regulation, which you, again, you don't really see. Um, but there's lots of examples. So uh, if you go to the Open Source Observatory, I think this is something that was uh, funded by the EU Commission and they sort of just 
crawl and map for different governments announcing open source initiatives. So we're seeing this um, transition into uh, the adoption of, of sort of the open source way when it comes to setting policy, um, which I think is pretty cool. I'm gonna try and go quickly because I only have a few more minutes left. Um, and then I'll just briefly talk about open source and open standards. These are sort of the main differences between open source and open standards. Uh, standards take longer to develop and change. Standards are consensus-based compromises. Open source is sometimes developed a lot quicker. Uh, and standards define useful, uh, predictable boundaries. So why can't we have one open banking API standard, which would arguably what the banks should be, uh, should be sort of advocating for? Well, there's a lot of reasons, um, re regional historical differences uh, in how the EDOMs are created. There's literal language barriers that create different sort of uh, branches and how people think in coding. Uh, software stacks might be different. There might be technology limitations of, of the country when it comes to their, how their banking system works. There could be different privacy laws. Um, service level agreements uh, could be uh, different depending on the country. And the, like in Canada, for example, there's laws that say banks have to, um, can't interact with certain vendors or can't outsource things to certain vendors. Um, the authentication journey might be different depending on the country or even the bank, uh, the scope of the data and the intended functionality of that data might be different depending on the, um, the government and the regulation. For example, Canada only is talking about doing data aggregation. It's not talking about right access or payments initiation, whereas in the UK and Europe, they do pay and uh, pull or write and read uh, access for data. Um, the monetization strategy may have developed differently, so some people might want to be making money off of certain uh, premium data versus other governments might say, no, this has to be published um, openly, thinking like credit rating scores, et cetera. And there could just be sort of differences in how people want to design things. So there's obviously um, you know, a reason why we can't have one open banking standard, but that's not to say that um, we shouldn't be aiming for that. And this is where I'm going to get briefly into open standards versus proprietary standards. So I think everyone knows you know, the main difference between an open standard and a proprietary standard, but there's these other organizations that are do these things called quasi-open access or quasi-open standards. Um, and I would just say, you know, if you have an organization saying they're trying to introduce an open banking standard, make sure you're looking at the terms and conditions of that license. I think a big red, big red flag is if they make you sign an ELA, EULA to actually access the standard, it's not open. Uh, and there's gonna be a bunch of issues around privacy and anti-competitiveness uh, in actually helping develop that standard. Um, we're having a bit of, there's been a bit of debate in Canada uh, around a standard that uh, some of the banks have adopted. And I think they've done that from the perspective that they wanted to take that sort of defensive strategic approach, but it's created, um, issues with the fintechs and the government, and essentially it's kind of slowing down the adoption of open banking, or at least the technical standards. Uh, but why should we have one open banking open standard? Uh, it promotes interoperability. It's not a secret sauce thing. This is again, this is like infrastructure. It's something, it, you know, same thing as FinOS. They try and develop things that are non-competitive. So we don't need to have multiple standards. If you go to the, any of the other presentations, they're talking about standardizing on data frameworks, et cetera, and open sourcing internal code. It, it should be the same thing for open banking APIs. Um, it would eliminate the need for that cottage industry of fintech aggregators. I mean, I think that would still exist from a consulting perspective, but it wouldn't exist from a, you know, we have to use a, a third party platform. It would decrease overhead costs of all the organizations of having to develop to multiple standards or different uh, banks' APIs. Um, it promotes the Open Data Initiative goals, uh, the UN CATAD goals as well, uh, around uh, data flows and, and open data sharing. Um, and arguably, the large banks are gonna benefit anyways uh, with the demand expansion effects. Um, second last slide, I believe, um, so these are some examples of different open banking tools that are actually open source. 
that you might want to look at or, or think about. I just learned this morning about the, uh, the FinOS one, uh, the Open RegTech initiative. I just found out about this morning, so I haven't looked into it, but that might be something where you know, maybe we have an open banking RegTech initiative under FinOS. Um, it could potentially you know, help solve a lot of um, the regulatory barriers that would exist for the op adoption of open banking for not only the uh, fintechs, but also the banks. Uh, so yeah, final slide, uh, just strategic considerations. Um, uh, open access, or I was calling open access, I trying to change it to quasi open access. I don't really have a better term for that. If anyone does, let me know. Uh, it's not the same thing as having an open standard. Just be wary of that. Uh, ELAs can restrict usage. It could create gatekeeping, which leads to less independent contributions. Uh, and that perceived lack of transparency might actually increase the need for government oversight, um, which would be the opposite effect of what uh, the industry-led body is looking for. Um, fair competition is more likely with open standards because, again, everyone can see it and you don't have to sign uh, or pay to actually help contribute to the standard. Transparency leads to uh, that increased participation. Um, I can go on an, a GitHub site right now or GitLab and help contribute. I don't need to go through you know, motions and sign confidentiality agreements to, to work on uh, closed standards. Um, hopefully, you know, I had that slide about all the differences, but hopefully open standards would lead to less standards and, and you know, a single standard that maybe even the globe, uh, I'm being way too utopian, but maybe even the globe could adopt one day. Um, the other thing, as I was showing, governments are starting to like open source. You're seeing like the UK, Canada, Australia putting out policies saying that open source is sort of the framework that we should be adopting on the way forward. Uh, and then, Open banking is really, it's about fintechs and banks, and I think a lot of banks think about like the threat from fintechs and losing that market share, but sometimes they forget that this is also about Apple and Google and, and Microsoft and stuff coming in and actually offering uh, accounts or, or financial services and becoming that aggregator that would then create that disintermediation for um, uh, the banks. So they might be too focused on fintechs and not focused enough on the big uh, tech companies and so what better reason than to have it uh, open standards instead of having something like Google create a standard that then we're all sort of beholden to. So yeah, I think I have a couple minutes left for questions, if there are any questions, but uh, that's the end of my presentation. Uh, any questions or comments? It's not going to shift the market share significantly. I think it'll create that deep transformation in that there will be more access to data, but I believe with the demand expansion effect that the large banks will essentially buy their way into the data analytics and, and buy the fintechs that are doing well at that, and then people will not be switching to other like challenger banks. I mean, show of hands, how many people actually use a challenger bank here, out of curiosity? One, two, three, four, that's half. Oh wait, no, okay, well that disproved my theory actually. <laughs> I was talking to people last night and they're like, no, I don't do challenger banks, so I don't know, maybe I, this might not be the best uh, <laughs> sample, but um, yeah, so that it's, I think it's a market share thing. It won't change the market share, but it would still, it's still gonna sort of change sort of the dynamics of finance for sure. Uh, any other questions? I have two minutes left. Sir. 
Yeah, I know what you're talking about. I, I, I agree. I mean, I'm fully on board with machine-readable um, uh, sort of regulations. I think you're seeing this in the digital ID space as well, where they're sort of coming together as a group to discuss how digital ID is going to roll out, which is very much related to open banking. It's going to run essentially on the same rails. Uh, and then, um, yeah, I, I would say on other sort of new things like privacy and stuff, you could essentially use something like uh, GitHub or, or something to sort of provide that transparent sort of advocacy. Um, there's a whole bunch of stuff going on with industrial policy and, and how we're trying to break up sort of the monopolies that started forming after they did all the de antitrust deregulation in the 1980s. So we're kind of seeing the pendulum swing, swing back, which is pretty neat. Uh, because we're actually doing it in a digitized way as well, which is increasing transparency. So uh, it's interesting times ahead, but yeah, I see it, it, there are tons of opportunities for sure. Uh, so I think I'm at time. Uh, if you have any other questions, feel free to chat uh, later. Uh, I'll have a drink with you guys later. Thanks again for everyone attending.